celebration of the day. A wonderful man, gave so much both to this country, his home country of Hungary, as well as to the department, universities, and other communities. He had a strong commitment to design, to planning, and to creating beautiful spaces. And I want to thank the Thoughtless family for all the generosity and leadership for them. Because, as anyone knows who's had a family members of Darren, you're sharing them with a lot of people. And, and Julius was, was incredibly generous with his time, talents, and at their house, dinner, lunch, or something for a lot of people today, a year ago. He did the movie that Julius entertained many people. I also want to express our real sympathies for their loss to Lydia and to the community, and of course to you yourself. When we think of Julius's legacy, I know he would describe his grace and achievements. He loved his work, and he was so young. It was neat to see him sort of soften as a person as he came to the world with his grandchildren and his grandparents. So over the years, Julius and his wife Edith put out two funds in the work. These funds, first the Fabulous Fund, began the International Fabulous Conference on Lazy Community Planning in 2004. And we honored Julius this summer in Budapest, the seventh Fabulous Conference on Lazy Community Planning. We brought together international landscape and creative planners to discuss the challenges that Julius spent his life with, looking at resilience, looking at Ecology and community support planning. The second fund promotes exchanges between the faculty and student body, the Hungarian University of Agriculture and Sciences. So today we have Akos Kestely, who is here representing Hungary for the two years. So on our program, we have several remembrances of Julius. They're all going to be brief, but I promise you. From both colleagues, friends, and alumni who worked with Julius during different periods of his life. We know that each of you have many fond memories of Julius as well. So we do have a memory book that is not sort of but uh, the slides for if you um, had a chance, please do that. We also have an online form that is in the artist for the for the two as well. But today's in a sort of celebration of Julius's story for life. That is a very somber moment. You would want us to remember with a smile and a toast and enthusiasm for life that you share. I was going to share a lot of my memories, but my memories are in the of what I an article about Julius and his life, and I'll tell you what's wrong with it. there. But I want to have others share their memories with Julius. It's my memory. Very visceral, I think I would say. Before you get to that, I wanted to thank the people who want to say that. That's the staff of the Hensley Architecture Regional Planning, which includes Terry Trudeau. Stacey Richardson, Peter Brew, Brent Water, and our students and citizens and other students. Let's give them a round of applause. Because you know nothing happens in the right place to us. And Julius was very good at this. He always made films of the community that we tired. I want to start off with a welcome um, uh, Dean Carl Lentmeyer from the College of Social Media. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. We welcome you to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. It's terrific to see so many people here who have affiliation both with the landscape architecture and department and it's it is always a celebration that our past students, faculty, alums, people that are part of this college. I didn't have the opportunity to come to the visit here about a year, but I also know over the years that you've learned a great deal about the person by the number and the quality of the people who remember him or her, and also all the stories. And the references that they have to share. So I think I've learned a great deal over the course of this afternoon. Um, it was a 
Your sound thing. No, I'm not. Um, shall go. Julius um, and his family lost their farm. They were arrested, arrested, tortured, and jailed. Soon after the Hungarian Revolution, <clears throat> Julius boldly escaped from Hungary to begin a new life in America. Set up in New Jersey, learned English, and it's hard to Earned a bachelor's degree in agronomy from Rutgers University. He continued his education at Harvard for the year in his MLA. After graduation, he was appointed as assistant professor here at the to this thing on your computer. No, that's mine. And that's all the way up. And that's all the way up. Following the issue, he was articulating theory and developing parametric methods for landscape planning. I learned the importance of research for advancing landscape architecture from a professional field of a respected academic discipline. Go on that track. At UMass, Julius founded the Method of Land Use Planning Research Group, establishing internationally respected science based parametric approach to landscape assessment and planning. The Method Group also pioneered the computerization of landscape architecture in the 1980s. After the 1980s, Julius refocused his research on the theory and practice of greenland as a flexible approach to integrating natural, recreational, and cultural preservation uh, appropriate to international application. In 1985, Julius was inducted as a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects. In 1997, he received the ASLA Medal, the highest honor given by the Society. After his retirement from UMass, Julius and Eva Thedos established important endowments at UMass to sponsor a biennial international conference on Green West and Landscape Planning. Julius also wrote his memoir, Simon Kulak, uh, basically a group of colleagues here, and I'm excited to follow up if you'd like to read it. It's sort of one 
from the story of his life. Childhood to uh, also retirement. So that's the um, that's a professional part, a personal part. Um, I remember Julius was a rigorous and inspirational teacher. <laughs> also, my mentor and a true friend. I learned many lessons from him, but three of them really stand out. Briefly, first, on your own education. As soon as a student in 1972, the young Samuels was quite an exuberant professor. Three of you in 1972. I thought that 50 years. Some of you were here. Um, people show dozens of acetate overlays during every class. Many dozens. <laughs> students can join us and didn't have time to take notes. They suggest you come early and copy the slides before class. They also acknowledge that some students had a difficulty understanding this accomplished accent. <laughs> he remarked, intelligent people don't seem to have a problem with that. It's a bit of a tough love. Um, and I learned that um, things are great lessons when you mass, the right areas of these you know, we don't have uh, people to go to the end that operate 18 hours a day, we get people who uh, go in and growing up with persons. It's kind of a theater to play it. We got all the resources to play it up, they do a and show up. So, kind of like that, an attitude in my education. They call it only. Next lesson. Testing the system. Through the brutal communist rule, Julius learned that the system wasn't always airtight. And by pushing back and prodding, we could often get around or avoid obstacles. Clever young man. I learned from Julius how to test the system. At one point, as an example, at one point in the department, I think one of the department men who also here today, uh, there's a link to pay him. So we we have to keep keep track of our there are some costs. We started saying all faculty have to write down eight twenty copies, one sided, two sided, and who's going to pay for it? So Julius said, you know, they're not going to really watch the costs. So that's how he tested the system. I did all my syllabus, but I could have been going on. I also learned in another context with Julius about this. Uh, when, when confronted with theological or overly bureaucratic rules, I'll accept them. But tell them, like, that doesn't make sense. Don't do it. Try, try to uh, get around it. And the last uh, memory lesson I have with Julius is I call it boomerang. People. Anyone who really knew Julius knew he was an exceptionally kind and generous man. Generosity was legend, and he benefited many. And he you, I know. He believed that by doing good things for people, they would often return the favor. Sage advice, both for academia and for life. I can think of no better tribute to Julius than all of you being here today uh, to share your memories, experiences, and facts. We respected you, we loved you, and we missed you, Julius. Rest in peace. So is Jack. Uh, next speaker is Akash Benson Kestelai, PhD student from Hungary, University of Agriculture and Sciences, uh, in Greece and the United States. I don't know about this, I was a week ago, I think about that, so uh, yeah, I was very brief, and I'm just like, you know, I don't know how uh, better to do it than you. Uh, I just see somebody uh, wrote this very brief in the year, and then he said, like, uh, I'm five, I'm not just talking about five. <laughs>
Russia needed to deliver in that period. The first time I was going to Russia, they wanted to deliver their support to the students. You go to Russia, what did you do this for a long time? Before I know it, they're harassing us, the Russian. We met it, we computer. We met it up and installed the first computer lab in Russia dedicated to students. We also started with the first planning program in Russia. Then we met up with the practice in the US. Now, it's hard to figure out during this. It's so real life, it's so real. One time, I don't know why I got the money, you wrote a message to a Filipino bus to go to London. He did both one of us, second and third one of us. He had no idea where he got the money. He was in the Congress with me. He went there, he did great time for two weeks. He was full of problems where he lived in the Indian desert, in the Indian vineyard. He did it for us. He took us to Lake Baldwin, which is a big vacation bed in Malibu. And it was almost as if all these German families used to come to the place of it. It took us to some villages, which is a lot of villages, and it took us to the library and the wearing company, which is the community of medicines, and the state medicine. Yeah. So they expect to know how to have the money. They expect to spend some time to be here. The fact is that 15 of us had a great time in Hungary for two weeks. Well, we don't like that. <laughs> I didn't ask him a question. <laughs> and one day, he just decides that he wants to do the lab in the studio. The person knows. I know the studio lab is at the Congress of the Day. So he says, uh, it's not a good job. So I say, sure, I just didn't talk. So you just have to give him the money. No problem. Each eh? student has to pay $50 for it. And at that time, maybe it's $50 for it. It wouldn't go on now. He stops it in the left computers. Before I know it, I'm doing that kind of thing. But he's been, he's a promise, and the chancellor, and everybody wrote him this. How far are you? You can make a decision about laughing. <laughs> So the student called up, yeah, let them return to the university. So the friends call them. This is not your fifty dollar. <laughs> so you have to spread it out. The point is that here we have the vision. We have the we have the first we do the lab to the dedicated suit ever. And it got to be more complicated because the other students found out about it from the university. They decided that the university worked it, it comes with food. So, Meryl Wilman, who also explained some time ago, he was an assistant department head. They said, Meryl, you reach out of the line. <laughs> and poor Meryl had to chase out of the student to go to the department. Now, the, Somebody I knew because of your good nature, you did a nice thing, didn't you? And every semester, students invited all the secretary of the who were allowed to make there. Every single semester, who did it to cook it, to be all aided. And it was a great thing, he never forgot about it. But there was another thing he just sort of said, I have to tell you about it. He had a, a computer, a lady with a computer. Person who wants to measure. She had a problem. She was a building. And we didn't know how to build it. We didn't know how to manage it. It was not economic for me to go to the very rich to inherit a few million dollars from her father. But she just said, No, I'm not going to say that because she had a building problem. We organized the intervention. We had the whole side of the intervention. And unfortunately, it didn't work out. He unfortunately died without knowledge. But the point is that Julius really paid attention to uh, what was the thing. The last time we go, the moderate period for Julius was the time. In the early 80s, the John Mollick would talk about it. We had a wonderful program called the National Rural Fellows Program. 
This particular data can be found in the special program for mid level professionals who want to advance degree. So they came to us to start us and had the internship in between some important academic things. There was one fellow, John, I don't remember the name, a very handsome Afro American guy. And he spent the internship in Alabama, the governor of Wallace. Now, I don't know how many of you are old enough. Remember Gabriel Wallace, he was a super segregationist and you're not for president, but he was not like this. <clears throat> but it's still the example when we say, no, I know. Oh, okay. It's still the account there. <laughs> and I guess the students taught the course for these students and what the students thought about nothing. So, <laughs> So these students go to go and we got in the bullets that they both met him. Now, Gabriel Bullets apparently in one, one relation was a pretty nice fellow. It's only politically about that to be very person. So one day he comes to his students that's pretty paid for it. What the hell is this method all about? What is method? So here we go. Serious method of method ends up in a in Alabama and the government. Therefore, now we're talking to you. Thank you very much. Very much, dear. And I forgot to mention that we do have a slave survey. Most of the buildings are built over and down the other on the right side. Um, we have this thing with two lots of interior buildings. Take home to you and you can have to stay in the family as well. So our next speaker is uh, Jessica Allen. Julius is last meeting by the main party of the community she worked with. Um, and she's a part of the Grand Canal of Valley Green Valley. She's the uh, planner, she planner, and she's the This is great. It's my favorite reading. So wonderful to honor you guys. I'm just going to share a couple of um, memories of um, that I have with him. So when I started in UMass in 2000, I was advised by day one we needed to show up with a resume in your hands if you had any chance of getting a research assistantship or a teaching internship to get the coveted tuition data. So I show up day one, orientation day, um, I'm sitting in the Procopio room, all the professors are talking about their research projects, what they're working on, um, with the class that they teach. And Julius, in his big booming voice, talks about green waves. So passionate about green waves. And I have spent four years working in Washington, D.C. for a land conservation nonprofit. And I'm like, okay, green waves, I can get behind that. That sounds cool. And I'll see if he's got any positions available after that. So um, orientation wraps up, mark right over, I sit down into Julius. Um, I make my pitch, try to explain what I've been doing for the past four years. Do we have any positions open? Um, do we you need know, something that, that I could do, work with him. I handed him my resume and he looked at it and he immediately focused on the fact that I was an undergraduate degree at St. Michael's College, where he went and was in the English immersion program as a refugee. So we spent a few minutes talking about St. Michael's College, Vermont, how beautiful it is, um, how it got them started in America, um, and then looked at me and said, sorry, I don't have a position for you this year, um, but I will, I, I'll consider you for next year. So um, I'd like to think that it was my strong work ethic, my resume, my organizational skills that got me to work with Julius for three years. Um, and uh, I think really my management thing like that opened me um, Over those three years, I learned that Julius Clark was much bigger than his wife. And that deep down, he really was the biggest softie. He was like a hard candy with a, with a soft center. He was so generous and so kind. Um, and he pushed students hard for a reason. He saw that there was potential in you that you didn't actually see in yourself. Um, and he knew that he could get out of him. And so he would push, he would call me screaming at me, where is this, where is that? Um, but, you know, you dig in, you get it done, because you want to make people proud of you. Something you, you know, somebody you wanted to, to make proud. Um, 
And it's only because of the few years that I have my one and only academic publication <laughs> on green rights. It's not something I ever would have um, pushed for in my, in my own career, but he insisted that I didn't take my thesis and get it published. So because of Julius, I have my one and only academic <laughs> publication. Um, he also had immense joy in small things in life. And as I get older in my life and in my career, I realize how important that is. That whether it was a really strong cup of coffee, a fog buster coffee, um, whether it was insisting they take the soup uh, at a lunch meeting, um, whether it was um, my favorite when I went to this house is we would put something food or wrong and a cup of tea, and you can see it's that much better. You don't want to put too much, but just a teaspoon. Um, I'm also grateful to Edith and how gracious they were in welcoming um, students that came to their home. Edith provides the most delicious snacks, baked goods, homemade hummus. Um, and I also want to thank Edith for coming to my defense on a couple of occasions, and Julia's got a little bit too fired up. So, um, <laughs> And his generosity continued after graduation. After I graduated, um, a new bride. My husband is an AmeriCorps attorney. He's making next to nothing. I have a new job. I'm job searching. And Julia hired myself and another grad student to um, assist him in getting a subdivision permitted for a property that he owned in Connecticut. I don't think the subdivision was ever built. I don't think he had every intention of building the subdivision. But he knew that we were short on cash, that we couldn't afford groceries. And so he came up with a project for us to work on. Um, and it gave us great permitting during on top of also helping to pay the bills. So that's just one uh, story of his generosity. I will continue to think fondly of Julius, not only his kindness, but his immense contribution to the profession, his story of overcoming hardship as a refugee, and his influence on the United community and the American department. Thank you, Julius, for pushing me to find my potential, as you did for probably hundreds, maybe even thousands of students before me. Your legacy was on all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Our next speaker, uh, uh, these are sort of like, I would tell Mike, he's the half a minute of the He's uh, he's going to be back really good. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Eric John Mullen, a retired graduate of the University of Frank Seeger's my home. What is doing this to me? And it's my office to me. Robert, you're not translating. Yeah. Thank you. Speak in my. You got to speak right in. Julius, Julia Faros, thank uh, me. Yeah, uh, good. Everybody in this room can say the same. Where are we today without Julius? How far would we have gone without Julius? And what would drive us today without you? So his support and energy in Julius seemed to make it across like some secret <laughs> And um, I also got question on you that that's <laughs> true. And um, you were the true leader, a captain in a team. Um, he was generously not acknowledging that people come with different spirits and you would always find ways to turn this into an advantage for the better of Connections, networking, team play, staying grounded. As a teacher, it's that is the elementary. Take nothing for granted, follow up, be organized, and be controlled, strategize, be humble, and put it to yourself. You just share succession for nature, rivers, and soil, from Danube to the Connect. You also shared 
the dedication, passion for hard work and effort. The fried chicken does not come to you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Jewish connection to the University of Hanover, Germany made it possible for me to become a 26 year old exchange student to this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the first person that picked us up from uh, the bus stop, he just met bus stop of downtown Amherst. And we hopped into Jewish stuff and passed Amherst College. And he has to. Do you know Austin? Do you know Austin? Real yeah. ones. Yeah. Well, Jews will forgive him, and even if you find out that it's probably not the future powerhouse of Let's Get Planning. <laughs> um, but you will always recognize and acknowledge all the facts and facets of landscape architecture, including design. And Jews and Edith provide the first light, the first breakfast, the first paintings, the hospitality, and even the picture of land and and Jews also designed the first Gulag terrace in the world. So we're here to celebrate and be part of Jewish legacy, overcoming boundaries and frontiers, like he did as a young farmer's son, student, a scholar of prayer. And this lesson is today we have always more in common than things that separate us. Yes, we all miss you, but in spirit, you establish. Let us believe that friendship and relationship rule, and let's work all together on a bigger plan. Thank you, Julius. Good night. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I'm to go on with the part of the wife uh, to the Bible's family. Um, I have to admit when I first had to get curious that I was six feet tall. Um, I was down to five feet nine. <laughs> and, and, and actually, uh, I'm more content that I'm better. And thank you for that. Now, um, I feel especially honored to be here because when I look around the room, I think I've known Julius the longest of anyone connected to UMass. And the way it worked was this that um, I heard him before I saw him in 1966. I decided to become a city planner at UMass at the recommendation of Land of Friends and taking courses with Professor Ted Bacon and occupied the North Studio of the upper floor of Wilder. Almost from the first class came the booming voice of the Land Art Studio next door. Phrases such as, where is your North Arrow? Phrases such as, you need to show me more shadow. And phrases of go, go get a double zero pitograph bellowed through the hallways. And there I was, a little bit intimidated. And I asked my friends about this person, and they probably said he was this new guy who was forcing us to be the best that we can be. It was Julius at his finest. <clears throat> Later, Julius first movie came to my planning studio class as critics, where we had to design the studio. John Mullen designing the studio, designing the subdivision is indeed something dangerous. <laughs> Many of you know I can neither write nor draw legibly, and my product was far from being up to snuff. Julius, after thoroughly addressing my shortcomings, came up to me and gently praised my effort and said, I had a very good chance of being a very good planner. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Let me say that I was thrilled, and the story goes, I did. Yeah. And that uh, and it was an honor to be there. And to this day, I can think I can see Julius at first saying, Why is that 50 acre subdivision box? Well, I, when I saw it, I saw the, the problem was supposed to be 0.5. 
I'm about a 58 years for, for household. <laughs> and, and you met those who knew, knew her and, and knew Julius. He had seen the economy, the meaning. And nobody could be so far off from the history of Madison and Mark. Mine were. And Julius said, Mullen, you're going to be a great city time. <laughs> <laughs> Flashing forward 12 years later, I was back at Wilder, as a junior faculty member, and a substitute for Julius, then in Australia, and became the graduate program director. The department head, Gustav Dugas, guys, he was clear don't change a thing until Julius returns. It was at this time that I realized respect that the yellow LARP program had been Julius, and indeed that it was likely of his making. In fact, he took us from being a largely technical program to one that was forward looking, visionary innovative and collaborative. In many ways, he captured the best of planning and landscape architecture and intellectually steered us to something called landscape planning. This occurred because of his drive and his intellect. And he did this in an apartment marked by giants. Our faculty consisted of veterans and immigrants scarred by war committed to design planning at a world scale, and deter determined to make our communities a better place. I don't know how many of you realize at the time the MRP faculty consisted of seasoned academics formed by experiences in Hungary, Canada, Israel, India, South America, and Asia. It was really something quite special. Of these giants, Julius Paramount created the Bentland program, brought in faculty and students from Germany, Australia, and Portugal, co-authored co a book that brought Olmsted back into the public eye and developed a working program of Hungarian scholars. Finally, perhaps most importantly to me, when I became a dean, was the realization that students needed money. We pushed all of us to go out and get grants. And I, and I can tell you that when I was when both department head and planning director, it was the greatest thrill for me to have Julius come into my room every, every September and say, John, I have ten assistantships for you. Ten assistantships. And Dean sitting here knows what the value of that was. And one of the greatest thrills that I would have after Julius left was um, we can offer you an assistantship for the next two years, paying everything, including medical. It was a wonderful, wonderful warm day. And that happened. Above all, I still think it was the emphasis on design and planning from local to world scale that captured us and still does. I was fortunate to walk in the shadow of this giant, and I have benefited immensely from his guidance. And for that reason, I am now wondering, as where Julius is now, whether or not he's working from global to heavenly scale. <laughs> <laughs> And indeed, if that's possible, he will be doing it. Amen. God bless you, Julius, and he's a great man. Thank you very much, John. Our next speaker is Neil Sigur, who's one of Julius's neighbors, who is a student and senior district planner here at the end. Well, I think it was right to leave a lot of these just professional uh, uh, accomplishments, which are many to other folks. Um, but having been uh, one of his disciples at uh, the GIS evangelist, I uh, have to remind people that um, he was a giant in the early days of uh, the development of GIS technology. I know a lot of people say that GIS was started in the um, Carl Steinitz, Delmarva Peninsula uh, studio there at uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design. And I know a lot of you know he was uh, an alum of Harvard School Graduate School of Design, but um, he was also a real pioneer here at UMass in the early days of, of GIS. And uh, there, um, I mean, UMass even had its own developed its own GIS software back in the seventies. In early 80s. And um, there are many folks that worked for uh, 
his Medlin research group um, that came on, went on to become uh, a huge uh, people in the GIS community. In fact, one of my favorites, I'm sorry he's not here today, is Michael Waltak, who are actually, there are also many uh, uh, folks, uh, students, Jewish students that went on to work uh, and are in the highest echelon of the desert, which is the big Microsoft and the GIS world. And one of my favorites was Michael Waltak, who actually developed the first uh, Windows-based GIS called ArcView from his little uh, house up in Montague. And actually, every for a while, had a satellite office in the Montague book mill. I don't know how many of you knew that, but it's probably why when I went to the Ezra Music Conference to accept a, a special achievement GIS award uh, for our work in, in, in the uh, town of Amherst Enterprise GIS, that when Jack, I had my 15 seconds of fame with Jack Dane and I'm walking up there and, and uh, he says, Hi, Nils, how's Julius? Uh, Julius had a huge impact, and so needless to say, he had a huge impact on my professional career. But I want to mostly talk about Julius' uh, effect on me as a person. And nobody but my own parents, my beautiful wife, and children had more of an effect on, on my life than Julius. Um, everybody knows that he was a hard worker and, uh, and a driven man. He worked from 8 o'clock in the morning. Six o'clock in the evening, took a break from six to eight, we did not disturb him. And then he worked again from eight to 11. And he expected the same out of you. So I often joke that every other job I've had since working for Julius was a piece of cake. Um, <laughs> and, but while it was a lot of long hours and, and uh, hard work, it was incredibly rewarding. And uh, not only for the knowledge of, and thoughts and insight that he shared with this experience, but also the access to resources and, and the people we provided. I got an awful lot of special access to resources in the departments that a lot of other students didn't enjoy. And I got to go to conferences and meet a lot of people. And I'll never forget when he got to introduce me to UP and the cards. So <laughs> I have to tell one little story too uh, about John. I, uh, once when uh, both John Cullen and, and Julius, my advisor, was on my uh, first master's project. And uh, I'm in a meeting, having a meeting about my thing, and Julie turned to me, you shut up, don't say it. And then he and John just like, had this really intense conversation about department politics. It was really special to watch and learn from that experience. So um, <laughs> I think, you know, we all know that Julius had a bit of a hard head to it, which is understandable given that he had to live through both the Nazi occupation and then the Russian occupation in Hungary. And I also, of course, remember the story of him weaving on a back of a motorcycle through the tanks uh, during the revolution in 1956. And then thankfully he made it uh, to the United States and, and, and ended up with Rutgers University. And then most fortunately for Julius and all the rest of us, that's where he met Eden. And it's impossible for me to talk about Julius that I'm also talking about him. Um, what a team. Uh, since Julius was basically working all the time, I think as you've heard, it's, it's pretty difficult to draw the line between his professional and, and business life and the home and personal life. So he loved to invite people from all over the world into his home and, uh, and have a meal, share stories, and obviously still get work done. Uh, so they were always so gracious in, in having hosting events and bringing people from all over the world together in their beautiful home. And of course, uh, I think Frank mentioned the, the goulash terrace. I mean, he uh, actually designed a terrace with three fire pits so that he could make mild, medium, and hot goulash for his Metland uh, research assistants every year. So uh, that was pretty amazing. So. Luckily, Sarah and I were also, my wife Sarah, who's also alone, uh, we're lucky enough to call uh, Julius and Edith neighbors. So when uh, we moved back to Amherst in 1997, I was working for a landscape architecture firm in Sarah Dennis Springs then. And uh, my uh, major uh, data backup unit died. And I'm like, oh my God, who has this anymore? I knew Julius had one 
as part of this research group. So I called them up and said, hey, you know, I could borrow for a couple of days so I can uh, you know, get some data off there and uh, keep, keep working. And uh, so that's when he told me about the job in, uh, in the planning department at the town of Amherst. So, uh, and, and of course I got the job, which I'm sure Elise had a lot to do with as well. Um, so when we came and moved back to Amherst, I wasn't sure where to even start looking for houses. I mean, you know, housing is an issue here in Amherst. So I called Billy's again. And thankfully, our timing was perfect because uh, the foreign student that they had living in the apartment next door happened to need to get out of their uh, lease early and the timing just worked out. So we, we moved in. And uh, that was a pretty wonderful year uh, living next door. And I walked also got to live in that apartment. Uh, it was such a beautiful place to enjoy all the gardens and the terraces and, and our little uh, uh A connection is still in the path. Um, and and uh, our one and a half year old son uh, absolutely loved E. Uh, e is what he called E. Mm -hmm. So that was that was a and then thankfully we were uh, able to get a house just around the corner uh, so that we were able to stay in the, in the neighborhood. So. So Julius, as you know, could be a real tough SOE, but as many people say, it's really the big song. Um, I know many students here, to, actually Sarah, whose parents ran a landscape architecture and planning firm, got her master's in landscape architecture, and had been thinking about doing the regional planning, but wasn't sure she could deal with Julius, but, uh, and, which is why she didn't pursue the master's plan in the regional planning. But uh, you know, once we came back, I obviously got to know Julius, uh, for, uh, much, much better. Uh, I know people agree to, with me that uh, he was one of the kindest and most uh, generous friends you could ever have. Uh, really, since many things to me, teacher, mentor, friend, and more. Uh, I am very grateful to you that been blessed with his guidance and benefited from his kindness and generosity. God said he was truly a good friend. So our next speaker, um, named UMass in the of June, introduced his connection to South Africa. Um, to excel in it, the team of my other three-year program in Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, and she really was actually doing this as well. So it's got to be conceived. Okay. Close. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, it's true. Um, you know, I'm here because we lived from Egypt, came to South Africa. I was a student of landscape architecture in South Africa. And I think our um, board of landscape architects is giving um, Julius a medal for all the work that he has done for landscape architecture all around the world. And he came to present. Um, the Greenway Vision Plan in New England, and I remember sitting in that talk, and then the thinking, "Wow, this is this is unbelievable!" And um, we had a brief encounter with uh, Julius and Edith, and um, they were traveling from one part of the country, from Victoria to Cape Town, and they happened to stay over in my hometown and have dinner with my folks. And then a couple of years later, I met Julius and Edith in Singapore at the conference. And Julius said, you know, I'm happy to map. He loved the green waves and love that idea of the map. And so he made it possible. Here I am. I met my husband, Edwin. And um, if not for that uh, connection, um, for that meeting and that talk. And, but really, I wanted to talk about um, Julius's kindness and generosity, like everybody else here. Um, you know, he really was, was so generous in sharing um, positivity, sharing his experience with everybody, happy to help you. Um, and uh, I'm always going to be thinking of Julius in that way. And thank you to Edith. And your children too for sharing the gift. And um, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our next speaker who is both at home here, it's actually in Colorado today. Um, and then it's Professor Mark, Professor Eric Sorkin. 
So we've been for years on the Green Wing Planning movement here, uh, and Green Wing Planning and other, um, other sorts of things. He, uh, he helped organize the Lautaro Mountain of Jack and Paco Shanai, and he helped organize this event on the ground. So we're going to turn it over to Zoom. So Julius was a colleague, mentor, and friend. He recruited me to come to UMass in 1983 and immediately brought me into the Metland research team, which was housed in a little building on Orchard Hill, known as the Solar Habitat. Julius was a master at garnering research funds and assembling a team of outstanding graduate students whom he mentored. The evidence of his mentoring is the record of achievement by Julius's former research assistants. As many of you know, Julius was not a technological wizard, which is why most of the email correspondence went through Edith. What Julius absolutely excelled at was recognizing trends and moving forward with bold ideas. An example of Julius's vision and tenacity was when in 1985, he realized the students in the department needed a computer lab for learning how to use GIS, CAD, and other software. There was no formal university mechanism for funding labs and the department didn't have the money to purchase computers outright. So Julius worked out a lease arrangement, which according to the university was technically not legal. However, technicalities were never something to dissuade Julius from moving ahead with an initiative. His method was to act now and ask forgiveness later. My wife, Polly, and I became good friends with Julius and his amazing wife, Edith. They were so generous and gracious in hosting meals for distinguished visitors from around the world and bringing people together to share ideas. At gatherings, whenever Julius might step out of line, which was frequent, Edith could usually set him straight with an Oh, Julius. As you can see in this photo, there was an amazing bond between Julius and Edith and such a playful side to Julius. He would say that his favorite pastime was playing with people. When we would go out to the faculty club, I always felt such empathy for the waitress who served Julius for the first time and had to undergo a Phobosian interrogation. Every luncheon with Julius ended with a dessert which he shared with the table so that it didn't interrupt with his slim figure. Julius had a profound love and commitment to the profession of landscape architecture. His contributions to landscape and greenway planning have built an enduring legacy. I don't miss the phone calls from Julius at 10 p.m. on a Sunday night during my pre-tenure days, but I do miss the lively exchange of ideas and his friendship. To Julius, I say thank you. And to Edith, Adrian, Bettina, and the grandchildren, I share your loss. Cheers, my good friend. So our next speaker is uh, Chris is, uh, Teresa Anderson, Professor Emeritus from the University of Porto. And uh, she is uh, zooming in from Portugal and she'll speak about the strong connection between Julius and Portuguese. Teresa. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I greet all those gathering here today for the Fabus Memorial. I hope you can hear me well. Yes? Okay. So a special word for the Fabus family um, and the Fabus home. It has already been evoked here several times. Hi, Edith, and all your children and grandchildren, and also to the Fabus friends. Also a special word to the colleagues at UMass, of course, Jack Ahern and Robert Ryan, who put this wonderful moment together, and to John Marlin, Maya Rose, Frank Steger, um, that I saw this afternoon here. Amazing. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm joining you from Portugal, and let me tell you that it's dark here. Here it's already dark. Um, so 40 years ago, uh, August 1982, 
I, um, I had applied for the Master of Landscape Architecture program at UMass. That's when I met Julius Fabos for the first time. Um, I know some of you expect me to tell the story, so I'm going to tell it again. Um, uh, Julius set an appointment for me at eight o'clock on a Monday morning. Then I was in Charlottesville, Virginia, attending the summer program. I had to take a bus from Charlottesville to Washington, DC. Then during the night from Washington, DC to New York City, and then from New York City to Springfield, Massachusetts, and then Amherst, the land of Emily Dickinson was waiting for me. And Sunday and Monday morning at eight o'clock, I end up at Hills North and down, down the hall is a walking a man in his shorts, his t-shirt, his flip flops, his hairs up. And I say, good morning. I'm here to meet Professor Julius Fabos. And he says, that's me. And I say, no, I'm here to meet Professor Julius Fabos. And he says, it's me. And I say, no, Professor, Professor Julius Fabos. And okay, that was Julius Fabos. That's how, that's how we met. Anyway, so some of you already know this story, but today was a day for it to come back again. He was 50 years old and I was 25. It was a hot summer morning, and I remember vividly the enthusiasm with which he took me through the empty halls of the university to his compacted metal laboratory, then at Wilder Hall, an assistant for landscape assessment and planning. Fabas let me know that everything was happening there. Computers, programming, at the service of landscape architecture. He made me visit another laboratory of satellite imagery at the forestry department. He said, personal computers will arrive soon, will arrive soon uh, at this department. So you just heard Mark Lindholt. And I think it was an amazing story, that Mark Lindholt story about these leads I had never known of. Anyway, so this was 1982. In 1983, I became Julius Faber's teaching assistant. I can assure you, it was not always easy. It was demanding, but above all, professional and personally enriching. I'm most indebted for those two years. I had the privilege of being a master's student in landscape architecture at the forefront of landscape architecture research and a major change in landscape architecture education and uh, Julius Faber's leadership and other colleagues such as Ibrus McDougall or even Irvin Zubi who had just left for the University of Arizona. I also recall the Metland Teal team, and let me mention the name of Dorothy Grainis, the programmer and her incredible silent role. Nils Lacour has already mentioned Michael Waltak, and I also can think of Tony Jackman and Steve Irvin from those early days. Julius Faber's focus was not computers. It has already been said. He had serious problems dealing with them, but rather, but his focus was rather a parametric approach of natural and cultural resources to make better decisions for the total landscape, understanding that landscape planning was a learning process to help us, and I quote, to deal better with uncertainty and increase our options. Preservation, protection, development, reclamation, and management of landscape were at the core of his concerns. I was still a student at UMass when Julius Fabas made his first visit in 1983 to Portugal, one of the first one of many, with Julius and with other colleagues that came along with him, with the Edith, sorry, and with other colleagues who came along with him. His daughters as well came. His role here in Portugal was seminal, both in the universities and government institutions dedicated to landscape planning and landscape architecture. The seminars and workshops he promoted endure in our memory. Last 30th of September, at the High Institute of Agronomy in Lisbon, um, Cristina Castelbrank, who is joining us this afternoon here as well, and I, we prepared a celebration for the eight years of landscape architecture education in Portugal. And Julius Fabos was one of the names evoked it together with Caldera Cabral and Sousa da Câmara. We have the fourth oldest landscape architecture program in Europe since 1942. UMass has the second oldest in the United States, I believe, from 1903. That makes me evoke the name of Frank Waugh, the founder. 
one day in the library, I found Willy Langes, the German landscape architect and educator, books dedicated to Frank Waugh and autographed by Lange. I found it the most relevant information for the history of Western landscape architecture. I went to tell Julius, the books should not be in the open shelves, but rather go to the rare book collection at the library. He rushed with me through campus to the library and we took the books up to the 24th floor. Just a final word about Faber's publications. I feel that today, Faber's early publications acquired a significant historic meaning. In 1970, he published a book titled Frederick Law Olmsted, Senior Founder of Landscape Architecture in America. In 1979, a new book came out, Planning the Total Landscape, a guide to intelligent land use that he selectively dedicated to Charles Elliott III, Benton McKay, and Ian McCart. That's to whom he dedicates his book. And in 1985, he published Land Use Planning from Local to Local Challenge. Uh, from Local to Global Challenge. My goodness, from Global to Local Challenge. Sorry, Julius, I don't know exactly the title of your book. <laughs> well, and this one he dedicated to his wife, is it? Um, they are also a part of Julius Fabs as a promoter of the Greenway movement and all that he has done in his last years of his life. But I really think that these are seminal books uh, when, we look, when we look back. Um, however, uh, I used to say to Julius, your book number one is, sorry, Son of a Kulak. How a Hungarian farm boy survived World War II and escaped Stalinist oppression for a new life uh, in America. It's an amazing book. We are celebrating a man's life we are celebrating a man's life, live with constant enthusiasm, daring, hard work, and a tremendous joy for life. Julius Favos was a devoted landscape architect, a generous, committed, and inspirational man, an observer of nature, landscape, and life. In Portugal, we are most thankful to his generous and significant contribution uh, that I already mentioned. Uh, Favos opened the door, not just to me, to, but to many other colleagues to study and research at the University of Massachusetts, a lasting experience of 40 years that's still going on, which is quite amazing. I can help to say and remember some sentences that we'll hear down the hall when, or when we meet with him. Like, for example, always say thank you. It costs you nothing. This was said many times at Hills North, room 105, at the end of our presentations, one but didn't do it right. Or then he'll remember us of the KISS principle. Do you remember? Keep it simple. He loved it. Do, not, do nothing I will not do, my friend. Or then he'd say, test the system. Or I, all, I can hear Julia say, to us all here, Thank you, Julius Favos. Enjoy, enjoy. Thank you. Um, Wayne John, with all of the very essential to attend, so he has submitted his talk and I'm sure it will be able to do it. Um, but I'd like to introduce um, he and her husband have run this firm and run the national firm of the year in the most important war. She also worked with Julius on designing one of the beautiful flowers in that auction during the day, which I can admire afterwards. Um, and she also designed the medicines for our children. Not how beautiful we are, but it stands before this place. That one is dedication. Lord and Sister. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. <laughs> Um, all right, so I consider Julius to be my first client. That's true, it's true. I was 23 years old. Um, this is over 20 years ago now. I met Julius and Jack, Jack and her. I had a research assistantship with Jack, who was a department chair at the time. Um, it was my second week of graduate school, it was a little up in the air. 
like Jack said, you sort of see her swim. He said, I'm going for something. Actually, yeah, I keep going. We won't figure it out. And then it soon became clear I was going to end up doing a lot of graphic design in the department. And I sort of became the graphic designer for the next three or four years for this department. Terry's lab, and she knows, knows what they do when they did. Um, there were, these were mainly the early years of the creation of the problems. I had a very small role in running that from the launch. The goal was that we were to reach a wide audience of many big planners, many big architects, many planners around the country and around the world. Um, this was basically the email and the internet were invented, but it wasn't really the mode of communication. This was hardcore, you know, old school mail. And we had to basically I had to design a brochure that you could register. Um, appropriated, we'll get to it, and you can fill it out and send it back. And we had to reach like 750 or 1,000 people around the company in the world. And my role was to design it, figure out the schedule with Jack and other folks for organizing. Um, so, so I had to find for this task. And I remember Jack saying, okay, I need you to do this thing. It's for this professor emeritus. You don't know him. He retired a few years ago. He heard it's architecture. He's an old planner. He's pretty well known. Um, and he and his wife have been down at the symposium. You should be aware of that. And I think it's just like my early years. I just don't be kidding. And then he said something like, um, he's got a practical taste. Oh, and he won the ASA Lay Battle. We should be aware of that. But good luck. So, so I was lucky. They liked me. He did the Julius and I got along quite well. And um, I would basically set up a time to meet, like I do now with my clients, we would meet in Jack's office. And I would bring my portfolio to work in. We would do progress, we would progress workshops. I'd lay all the work out. I remember I would be doing Urban Story there and Sandy and Sheila and I'd be doing the talk. And I'd go in and um, I would have all the work on a chat staff. Sometimes Jack would actually do the lead in this work session and Julie took script on it for work. He would look at it, he'd spend some time in the back of the chair, put uh, things up, he'd put them down. Um, and it was a real grit, it was rigorous, and it was a, it was a learning experience for me. Um, I was in the studio with my coursework, and I had to sing on top of it. It was like a whole other design experience with a real client. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't screw this up. I mean, this was a real person who came for a real job. So, I remember the taking out the color stain with the teal, gray, green, like the chartreuse color. Some of you probably remember that. He left me really happy. Like Teresa said, he was saying, Enjoy, enjoy. And he left. I felt like a genius. I got really excited about this what I do. You do great work for clients. They are grateful. And I, I you know, you don't have that in the studio. You just have grits. <laughs> so that's what this is great for me. Um, so when my mouth came up, I was asked to design it. It was a great honor. I used to historic very baby photo into Real Meadows, you know it well. It's very memorable. Um, it's the Connecticut River and it's just not the mountains. And that's my inspiration. It was a mixed media study and the sketches that I did work with Photoshop. Um, I carved it in wax and I tested this whole thing at various scales. Julius was part of the problem the whole way. Um, I taught my whole how to do these things, and he, he kind of mentored me through it. And then I walked down a solar shape, and we had a class in solar. Um, I brought the box with the metal that I packed to Julius, and he did. And I remember when he opened it for the first time, he, he sort of, it was very moving. He was, he was emotional about it, and it was almost ironic because I mean, his hand was so big. And this metal was so small, and yet yeah, this metal was a symbol, right? It was a symbol of the life of the farmer, um, trauma, and uh, loss and survival. And yet, yeah, so much accomplished it professionally and ultimately um, just this love of the land, pure love of the land. So, I was hoped. I really attribute you know, that that small thing that I, you know, that experience that I had in grad school early on 
So this idea of creating these from people works of art and craft design that brings joy, uh, sense of place and purpose. So Julie Matthew is an unexpected way who's on love to find my not to work with. He championed his students in the middle of the lobby of work with them long after he retired. And I really do believe he mentored women and men equally. In recent years, he and Edith really became basins of our studio when we established Garden Graphic Scholarship. They were one of the first to support it and make it a very generous donation. We will be always grateful for that. It was Julius, Jack, and Ethan who penned the nomination letter for our Girl of the Year Award for May Slay. For that, we will always, always be grateful. On behalf of myself, my husband, and our studio, it has been an honor to work with you. Thank you so much. Next speaker was one of the only one of his first students, but one of his early students. Um, from 1970, mm -hmm. uh, principal of Pete Simpson Association. Thank you much, Larry, and um, Fred, I do back in this department. Um, Julius, as we know, was a great leader in this department, but uh, he was also a leader in the profession, nationally and internationally, which was what made it so astounding to be able to be back around him here. We heard one of the things about uh, Julius, so I'll be brief, but um, I can tell you a couple of videos of our life at the Nell Lines Cross. Um, when I, I met Julius at Ben Mountain State Park in New York, today it's a day meeting, and um, I had uh, wanted to come last year, Robert. I spent 10 years in finance, and I didn't think I would be able to do the community problem um, without a design background. Um, but I met Julius and spoke with him, and then when I was so into the of um, I said to him, um, you know, when I was 15 years old, the novel and war of the Jesus. Um and there was the family, um, Hungarian family, the Judaisms, um, and they knew about my father, and they had made their way from Hungary to the bottom of the communists in, in Hungary, and uh, like Julius, because they had found the same thing. Um they lived with us for a year, and they went on to Canada for a better life. Um, but that resonated with Julius. I want you to come to my apartment in Memphis. Um, and we did that. I came up and he introduced me to John Martin, one of the advisors here today. And today he's willing to hold me in the uh, That fall, I moved to Memphis and started the three years of the um, master's degree program. I was truly the um, teaching assistant, which is wildlife. <laughs> um, and uh, the research assistant, and when it came time to graduate, um, uh, it was one of these who the PhD and be a teacher with that school was really a compliment. It's really coming from him that he felt that happen. Uh, but I went into the session, um, going to firm down in New York, I think the roles of the Internet started my own office in 1982, uh, which is still going strong 40 years later. Um, but in 1997, um, I was present with the and then and then trustee to the um, chapter in Washington, and then from there we won the head of ASA in Washington. Um, I was remember being down in the meeting with all the other trustees, and one of the responsibilities of the trustee this year is to um, select the um, recipient of the ASA medal. And um, we, there were all these trustees from all around the country. Um, but I say, you know, in my part of the world, Connecticut and New England, I don't know there's anybody who's doing more from the professional land population than the state. Well, the room just lit up, and all these people knew about Julie. And they were from the poor of the country, and I had no idea that they were so much about it. You know, I don't know how much I thought about it. Um, but they were, many of them were contacting the other universities, they read it, stuff, they studied in lectures and so on. So I was able to nominate you as a member of the Bible College, and there were other names like Bill Creeper, Carol Hunt, and the Pentecost, the Julius Harris Day. So then, uh, that fall, they had a slave meeting, um, when the time came to the dinner, 
um, then Edith and I went up with Julius um, and uh, Don Leslie, who was president, um, uh, made it say very, very nice to Bob uh, Julius of course. Um, and then he gave me the medal, he gave it to Julius and said, he's no man. Um, so I had a great thrill handing Julius the medal, picking it up his, um, around his neck with the president, and then they uh, threw you in the same way. And for us to get something um, back to Julius was, was a, a wonderful, wonderful feeling. So uh, Julius was our hero. And um, but the hero of truly delight was um, the Edith, and I just want to say uh, how much I appreciate the Edith shared so much and do it with it. Thank you, Edith. We love it. Thank you. Okay. I can say to you that it is an honor to be here. And I would like to say a few words. At this celebration of Julius's life, I would like to give thanks to everyone involved at today's gathering, and also to the many colleagues, administrators, students, and friends who knew him throughout the many years that Julius spent at the few mass. We arrived in Amherst in September of 1964 to the small campus with about 8,000 students at that time. The landscape architecture department head then was Ray Otto. Now, while I am visiting Wildwood Cemetery, I always stop a moment at Ray's place of rest, which is just across from Julius. To complete the triangle, Tech Bacon, the respective planning department, also rests just a few yards away. It is fitting that Julian is going to see very large colleagues in the cemetery with such strong connections with their profession. Julius also wished to face east towards the Hungarian homeland. He left behind his entire family and his aspirations to become a successful farmer after the 1956 uprising. His sister, who reluctantly stayed behind to take care of their parents, still lives in Budapest. Our daughter, Bettina, has created an impressive video documentary called Proud and Storm about the history of Hungary through the ages and the lives of the two siblings, one here in the US and the other back in Hungary, which shows us many of Julius' first influences and also the historic turmoil that shaped his early years as a refugee in the United States. Julius and I enjoyed a very rich life as part of the large community. And we met so many interesting people from all over the world, all of you at conferences or through inviting them to give lectures at the mass or by working with them when they decided to study studying. This led to wonderful invitations back to other institutions and countries, which Julius called boomerang effect. What you throw out comes back to you. Julius also had a special relationship with the American Society of Landscape Architects, and he invited almost all ASLA presidents to give lectures at this department. Most of them stayed at our house, where we developed warm friendships. One, Robert Mortensen, became so enamored with our cat Spike that whenever we met him again at another conference, he first asked how Spike was doing. <laughs> now, with the changing times and new challenges, Another generation of landscape architects is teaching our students new and innovative ideas about our land 
and looking forward to the future. But it is always wonderful to look back and appreciate all that has happened. I am grateful for the joy and satisfaction that this department and all of you brought to Julius's life and to mine as well. Thank you.